Hi everybody, hope everybody's having a good day. This presentation was done on History of Land Treaties by Hannah, Sandra, and Cynthia. If you have any questions, please jot them down and we can go over them at the end of our presentation. Hope you enjoy. It's been over three centuries since the land treaties have been signed between the Government of Canada and the Aboriginal groups, the conditions and sanctions of which are still fiercely a matter of dispute to this day. Different cultures, contexts, and language barriers meant that misinterpretations had taken place in the signing of the treaty agreements, resulting in forceful seizing of the land and eventually leading to bitter dissidents between the First Nations people and the Government of Canada. Prior to 2003, it was legal for First Nations people to bring forth any land claims against the Crown without approval from the federal government. It wasn't until 1973 that specific claims were finally being considered by the federal government from different First Nations people. Bill C-6 was passed by Parliament on November 4, 2003, called the Specific Claims Resolution Act. Even though the goal of the act was to provide the filing, negotiation, and resolution of specific claims to make related amendments to other acts, disputes still forwarded as the act failed to give First Nations the right to juris jurisdiction. Since only the Crown would have control over appointments to negotiating the process. The act also suffers from frequent conflict of interest and lack of funding to address claims. As a result, overcoming the difficulties in settling land claims still persist and struggle can be seen in concurrent conflicts such as those in Oka, Quebec, Caledonia, Ontario, and Ipawash, Ontario Provincial Park. A little over a decade ago in Oka, a village located off northern bank of Ottawa River in northwest of Montreal, Quebec made headline news in 1990 because their privately held land was sold to develop plans to expand a golf course and residential development onto land which had traditionally been used by, a Mo by Mohawk. The dispute began July 11, 1990 and ended September 26, 1990. The media publicized it as a violent conflict between First Nations and the Canadian government in the late 20th century. This land dispute was between a group of Mohawk people from the community of forgive me if I don't pronounce this right and correct me if I'm wrong, but the community of Kenestatake and the town of Oka, Quebec. Mohawks viewed this land as a common land. It was used to access their cemetery, recreational purposes, and for other First Nation community purposes. In 1987, Le Club de Golf de Oka, Inc. requested to renew the lease for their nine-hole golf course, wanting to expand it from a nine-hole to an 18-hole golf course. This request was granted by the government as long as the land was sold, as long as the land was sold of $70,000 for only the use of golf course expansion and nothing more or less. The occurred in 1989, Mohawks had peacefully protested in the town of Oka, stating the ownership of the land as theirs. This caused other problems such as the band council tension and the unsatisfactory negotiation process, land unification from the community. The land agreement was then rejected, resulting in a small group of Mohawks putting up a barricade and taking arms. More and more tension grew and gunfire was added in between the Mohawks and Quebec police. There was police officers there was a police officer casualty. Thus, twenty five hundred armed forces were brought in to get the situation under control. Eventually, the barricades were taken down and the instigators were apprehended by the armed forces. To this day, there has been no completed development between the two parties to resolve the situation, resulting from, sorry about that, resulting from the Oka crisis was the formation of Royal Commission and Aboriginal People, the RCAP. The RCAP was responsible for reporting all and any Aboriginal situations throughout Canada. The five-volume RCAP report was expensive. In fact, it was the most expensive Royal Commission report in Canada history, in Canadian history. Of a fascinating amount of $58 million, there, was also, there also have been many other land disputes besides Oka, such as standoff in Caledonia, Ontario.
1748, Sir Frederick Haldeman issued a pro proclamation authorizing Six Nations, a group of First Nations people, to take possession of and settle upon the banks of Grand River, including six miles on each side of the Grand River from Lake Erie to the river source, which is approximately 950,000 acres. The Six Nations territory is known as the Haldeman Tract in 1924. Canada set in the RCMP to remove the legitimate Confederacy Council of Six Nations. The armed invasion of Six Nation territory was a military operation. Using the RCMP, it was seen clearly as a declaration of war. The government claimed that the documentary support the Six Nations surrounding the land, now called Douglas Creek Estates, in 19, sorry, in 1841. The Six Nation Confederacy stated Canada absolutely refuses to address the land issue with Confederacy chiefs. It is a 200-year-old outstanding land claim of Six Nation. It is important to understand all the factors behind the rising tension related to the land rights pro uh, protest. A small peaceful protest began in February 2006 at Douglas Creek Estate developing development owned by Henco Industries in Caledonia, Ontario. The protesters were demanding that there would be no further development on their land and that the federal government settle upstanding Six Nation land claims. The protesters ignored a ruling ordered by the judge demanding they cease the protests. Police, had, police have not enforced a court order eviction. However, the sheriff of Haldeman County showed up at the site to read a revised court order which stated that if they do not leave, they could be arrested for criminal contempt of a court order. Provincial police now have the authority to arrest the protesters but have not said when they will do it. In April, it will be 50 days since the state, 50 days since that start of the standoff. It will be another black chapter of history built in Canada if people are arrested and construction is allowed to continue. It was announced that Government of Canada and Ontario have pulled out the talks concerning the recent land repossession at Caledonia, Ontario. When the Ontario Provincial Police stormed the Six Nations protest site near Caledonia, there were witnesses reports of police brutality. Several people reported being injured and 16 people were arrested. Mohawk Nations News reported, at 5.55 a.m. this morning, over 150 heavily armed Ontario Provincial Police invaded Six Nations land. Some carry M16 in the riot gear. Tear gas has been thrown at them. Some were pepper sprayed. Provincial police officials stated, we used the least amount of force possible and claimed they used restraint but had to use force during the arrest because of the behavior of some of the protesters. Later, they said several police officers were injured by the protesters. One officer suffered injuries after being struck by a bag of rocks. Hours after the police raid, protesters re-established their presence when hundreds of people gathered at the site. Tire fires were set as part of the road blockades. The police have established a perimeter after the protest site to contain the situation. Police officials claim their focus is on the public safety. At the protest site near Caledonia, Six Nation members and supporters reported claim, with the police keeping their distance and promising not to act. However, the RCMP confirmed Friday that they were, are now involved in providing assistance to Ontario Provincial Police. Prosecutors, sorry, the protesters are unarmed, but they are protecting themselves in a traditional way. The Six Nation peoples have been burning tobacco during their entire occupation for their protection. This is the only weapon that we have. We are calling upon natural forces to give us the wisdom, the guidance through this whole siege. The Minister of Indian Affairs, Jim Prentice, in the House of Commons, has stated that the difficult situation in Caledonia is one that requires a certain amount of wisdom and forbearance. At the end of April, a mass rally took place by non-natives and Caledonia local residents. They demanded at the end of the Six Nation protests, which was peaceful compared to one earlier that saw residents confronting the police and ended in an arrest. Protester Hale, Hazel Hill said, First, everyone know that we are still here. We are not going anywhere. There have been many media releases suggesting that the Bayer case are coming down and leading the outside world into the false belief that we are somehow going away. Not so. There have been many discussions about the Bayer case. 
but discussions are very long and deep regarding our position. We have no intention of leaving our reclaimed lands. Negotiations continue between Six Nations, Ontario, and federal government. And part of the discussion is the opening of the certain roads and lifting of the particular barricades. The occurred in 1989, Mohawks had peacefully protested in the town of Oka, stating the ownership of land um, as theirs. This caused other problems such as the band council tension and the unsatisfactory negotiation process, land unification from the community. The land agreement was then rejected, resulting in a small group of Mohawks putting up a barricade and taking arms. More and more tension grew and gunfire was added in between the Mohawks and Quebec police. There was police officers, there was a police officer casualty. Thus, 2,500 armed forces were brought in to get the situation under control. Eventually, the barricades were taken down and the instigators were apprehended by the armed forces. To this day, there has been no completed development between the two parties to resolve the situation. Resulting from, sorry about that, resulting from the Oka crisis was the formation of Royal Commission and Aboriginal People, the RCAP. The RCAP was responsible for reporting all and any Aboriginal situations throughout Canada. The five-volume RCAP report was expensive. In fact, it was the most expensive Royal Commission report in Canada history, in Canadian history. Of a fascinating amount of fifty-eight million dollars, there was also there also have been many other land disputes besides Oka, such as standoff in Caledonia, Ontario. Another historical land claim dispute involves the Ipawash Provincial Park located in southern Ontario. After years of negotiation, the Chippewas First Nations signed the Huron Tract Treaty in 1827. In exchange for the land, the British were to agree to partition a specific re reserve locations which could be expanded to accommodate the band if found too small. A lot of appropriate compensation and to arrange training in blacksmithing and agriculture by instructors. The report of the Ipurosh inquiry states that initially the Chippewas were told that they were to saccade roughly 700, sorry, 712,000 acres. However, they in, inadvertently ceded 2.1 million acres of land. The initial payment amount was reduced and the blacksmith and agriculture instructors were never made available. The infraction of the treaty caused great concern for the Chippewas, and as a result, they lost confidence in the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which states the First Nations were to be treated with honor and justice. In 1912, the Chippewas were pressured again by the Crown to relinquish more land, which was later sold to the provincial government for three times the amount to the First Nations. The part of the land sold was turned into an Ipawash Provincial Park and a year after, the provincial government created the park. The Ban of First Nation acts that native burial ground located within the park be protected and ensuring request was ignored by the government, leading to further tension. Money, 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 money. In 1942, during the height of the Second World War, the Canadian Department of National Defense sought out to seize the reserve land in Stony Point be used as military training camp. The government petitioned to the native people to voluntarily relinquish the land in exchange for money and promised to return the land after the war to which the native band refused, being wary and guarded over the inequity of past governmental transactions. The government arranged to seize the land without compliance with the native band, citing Section 3 of the War Measurement Act, which states the government 
sorry, the governor and council authority may do what is deemed necessary for the security, defense, peace, order, and welfare of Canada, including the disposition of property and use of thereof. So basically, the government said, you know what, First Nations people, we're doing whatever we want because we got war, and according to this act that we created, we can do whatever we want, wherever we want. The government handled the situation very hastily, as George Brown, the Indian agent, at that time states the military intended, quote unquote, to proceed with this scheme as soon as possible. Consequently, the appraisal was handled hastily, and a compensation to the families living on the land was many all. Under Section 7 of the War Measures Act, the government was responsible for covering the costs of relocating the native people living on that land. They were then integrated into another reserve. The government also made assurance that the land would be returned to the natives. Believing they have the right to land, the Chippewas of Kettle Stony Point First Nation has challenged the surrounding, sorry, challenged the surrendering of portions of land during the 20th and 21st centuries. However, the courts found that all of the transactions were legally valid. Tensions grew stronger over time in 1995. A group of natives planned a peaceful protest in order to gain exposure of their plight to return to and restore their land. The chief of the band wrote a letter of the belief of band, which stipulated seven principles to discuss and negotiate the public and federal government. One of the principles in particular state that they are committed to making a reasonable effort to heal the divisionist cause of the First Nation by the wrongful inflicts by Canada in their taking of Stony Point lands. Records show that the acting superintendent of the Canadian government, John Carson, noted there will be no negotiations with the Stony Points regarding their claim to ownership of the land and that the goal of the discussions would be removal of occupiers from the park. During the night, the protesters attempted to occupy a small portion of the park. The OPP were called in to maintain the peace. However, the government had decided that it was necessary to use force to remove the protesters as quickly as possible, citing public safety concerns. They had a SWAT team that was called in to attempt to control the group of protesters and a small riot broke out after police officials assaulted a protester during their attempt to arrest him. As more protesters arrived to assist the others, police opened fire using snipers and submachine guns, resulting in injuring of two protesters and the death of an Ojibwa man named Dudley George. The family of the man had called for an inquiry into the events that led to the Ipawash crisis to be launched in order to prevent such crises from reoccurring. The inquiry found that the men of the government officials involved in the crises were unconcerned with the facts surrounding the protests. Unsympathetic to the plight of protesters and ignorant and racist towards the interests of the Premier, Mike Harris was heard, uh, sorry, ignorant and racist towards the interests of the native people. Police officers were recorded saying offensive and racist remarks. Even the Premier, Mike Harris, was heard making an offensive comment demanding that they get the expletive Indians out of the park. It wasn't until 2009, almost 15 years after the Ipawash crisis and over a century after surround, surrendering the land that Chippewa of Kettle and Stony Point First Nations were finally permitted to a full control over the land of Ipawash Provincial Park.